Today, we're heading out to an old golf course on Long Island. Since 2018, it's been the Shoreham Solar Farm, an array of almost 125,000 solar panels operated by utility company Duke Energy. Today, it supplies the grid with about 25 megawatts of electricity, which Duke says could power around 6,000 homes. Solar power is getting cheaper and more efficient, so big farms are only getting more attractive. This one is a part of New York's goal to reach 6,000 megawatts of solar by 2025. But as modern as this farm is, in a way, it's sort of old school. It's one big centralized plant. Power is generated en masse here and shot through high voltage lines out to the grid. This is how the US energy grid mostly works. Lots of customers relying on a few big plants. But as we've seen in the past year alone, that's not the most resilient setup. Power outages in Manhattan. The power appears to be out throughout much of the community here. Hundreds of thousands of people across the Gulf Coast. Most of Lafayette is without power this morning. So how do you keep the lights on as more extreme weather looms? One solution is solar, just not solar that looks like this. To see what that means, we have to break the idea of a solar farm into tiny pieces and stitch it back together with a new kind of network. One that supplies real power from an imaginary power plant. The glory of solar technology is how modular it is. Each of these photovoltaic cells does the same thing as every other. So each piece of this array is a power source itself. That's why there aren't just solar panels on abandoned golf courses like the one in Shoreham. They're popping up all over. For example, a rooftop in Brooklyn. Okay. Oh. oh, wow. Okay. Cool. So this is the basic unit of community solar, just a couple of panels on the roof of a home or a business. Today, lots of homeowners are adding on-site batteries, too. They allow owners to store excess energy to use in a blackout or to sell back to the power company. This is the piecemeal solar revolution that's been happening alongside big farms like Shoreham. So I grew up in California, and uh, when I go back home, uh, I see solar just popping up everywhere. Justine Kalma covers all things environment and energy for The Verge. There's just so many opportunities to turn unused space into uh, something that's going to generate energy. So affordable now. The, the price uh, for solar has dropped dramatically from $30 a watt in 1980 to less than a than a dollar a watt uh, in 2019. By themselves, a small smattering of panels like these only does so much for a community. A big storm or some other hiccup is still disruptive for anyone who doesn't have solar. It's not enough to, to sort of save you from the larger problems that are, are plaguing our, our aging grid here in the US. But as more and more solar owners install batteries, new opportunities open up. All those batteries are little reservoirs of power, and if they all work together, they could become a power plant just like the one at Shoreham. This gets pretty abstract, so we're going to visualize it with some retro help. A copy of SimCity 2000, the classic city building game. So first we plan our little town, you need some land for industrial and commercial and residential, then you add utilities, plumbing, this actually becomes kind of a chore, and then we bring it to life. Okay, so we're gonna start with these three little neighborhoods all in a row. This coal-fired plant here is our baseload power. It's the default power source for our city. The three neighborhoods are the same, except for one variable. The first one has no solar at all. It relies on the coal plant for all of its power. In this one, some homeowners have rooftop solar for their own use, and maybe a few have batteries as well. And yes, we added the solar panels in post because this game came out in 1993. Neighborhood number three is the fanciest. Each building is wired up with solar plus a battery. All the systems are networked together and a portion of the power in each battery is usable by the power company. So say I'm doing some landscaping over by my power lines and whoops, there's a service interruption between the power plant and the neighborhoods. What happens now? Well, neighborhood one loses power immediately say goodbye to all the food in the fridge. Neighborhood two is patchy. The homes with solar and batteries are okay for now, but everyone else is out of luck. 
And Neighborhood 3 has power, because every building has a backup battery. But there's more energy in those batteries than the neighborhood needs. And thanks to the networking, the utility can pull power from lots of those batteries all at once. Neighborhood 3 has become a virtual power plant, and can restore power to all of the other homes until the lines from the coal plant are restored. Now, that's an extreme example, but virtual power plants can also make a difference day to day. There's an ebb and flow to community power usage. It rises every day when people commute home from work, flip on the lights and appliances, and settle in for the evening. If usage spikes high enough, a utility might have to call on a peaker plant, an on-demand power plant that can quickly kick out enough energy to meet peak demand. But no one likes peaker plants. They're inefficient and expensive, and they're often extremely dirty gas or sometimes coal. But in this case, the utility can again activate our virtual power plant instead. The utility gets its peak energy, and the homeowners get some cash for their extra power. If enough systems like this are installed, we could end up retiring a lot of peaker plants. In the real world, networked solar can create sizable banks of energy. This summer, energy providers in Northern California announced a plan to build a virtual power plant by outfitting 6,000 homes and businesses with solar systems. Their combined battery output could reach 20 megawatts. That's not far off from the shoreham facility. Now, fossil fuel plants have the advantage of running indefinitely. You can keep feeding gas into a peaker plant for as long as the peak lasts, whereas a battery network will eventually drain. But while it lasts, it's clean energy without the headache of dealing with individual solar owners. Virtual power plants are also a pretty package for utilities because they tie together a lot of residential solar. So they don't have to necessarily go in and knock on everyone's doors. It, it's like crowdsourcing a solar farm. There are still a lot of wrinkles to iron out. A bank of solar panels and a battery for the average home can easily cost between $25,000 and $30,000. That means residents will most likely rely on cash incentives and subsidies to participate. And that will take buy-in from policymakers and utility companies alike. And then there's the reality of our old, tired, confused grid. So there's a long way to go to upgrade our infrastructure because what we have now was built for fossil fuels. The grid was really built for energy to flow in one direction. And so there's gonna need to be really big investment in upgrading our grid so that it can accommodate more renewable energy. But every day, more household batteries are added to the grid. And in the near future, a whole new network of batteries could come online, thanks to electric cars. These electric vehicles can do a lot more than drive. You know, they are essentially batteries on wheels. They can drive 200 or even 400 miles on a single charge. But who's driving 200 or 400 miles in a day, right? And so what do you do with that excess energy? Well, you could sell it to the grid. In some ways, these technologies are arriving when they're needed most. California is ahead of the curve in solar, but the state is also suffering through some of the scariest climate emergencies. South Australia is also investing heavily in solar, and they know the stakes as well. For what it's worth, we don't need to choose between big solar farms and smaller networks. With the right upgrades to the grid, they can work in tandem just like other baseload and peaker plants do. The truth is, we will need all the different permutations of solar in the years to come. It's not so much just that I'm excited about it, but that we need to, we need to, to go that route. Um, there's no choice. Scientists believe that we need to essentially cut out our reliance on fossil fuels and slash greenhouse gases pretty much completely by 2050. And we can't do that without solar. It's just gonna be a part of, of life and our economies and our homes moving forward. Oh no, aliens. Oh, I did not build enough fire stations. Oh.